Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz joins us today to give us a primer on how to do apologetics among the nuns. Not the Roman Catholic sort, but the unaffiliated neighbors that are all around you. We're looking at Acts 17, Romans 1, and Psalm 104. So let's have a seat at the feet of Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz right now here on Cross Defense. Welcome back to Cross Defense, another episode. It's good to be with you guys. If you're going to be defending the faith, if you're going to be doing apologetics of any kind, if you're going to be doing evangelism of any kind, if you're going to be sharing Christ Jesus with your neighbors in any way, you can expect, if you are fighting the good fight of faith, that some will be critical of your words. They will be critical of what you say. They may not agree with you. They could call you stupid. They may call you a babbler. They may call you all kinds of things. They could launch all kinds of insults your way, or they could just ignore you. It's going to happen. And so you might have noticed the last two or three episodes, we've dropped in the very beginning of the show, the critical comment that I've received, and then by the end of the episode, we address it. Seems like a pretty good pattern, and we got a couple of these critical comments that we can always draw from, it seems like. So let's continue this process. Today, I got this one from Dale, who writes, Pastor Bramwell, I'm writing to you to say that I disagree with you about women reading the scripture lessons, teaching Sunday school, and performing other duties in the church. I'm wondering, if you feel that this is so wrong, why do you not bring this to the attention of Synod President Matthew Harrison? I think that if this is as unscriptural as you think, it should be brought to his attention. I don't really expect you to respond to this, as you don't seem to be someone that takes criticism very well. Sincerely, Dale. And I've omitted Dale's last name. Stick around to the end of the show for my response to Dale. And in the meantime... We have a great show for you today, my friends, here at Cross Defense, where we aim to equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul, all with God's Word. If you're not aware, I'm Reverend Tyrell Bramwell. I'm the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church out here in Ferndale, California, where, get this, get this, my friends, we don't consider Howard Zinn to be all that great of a historian. It's true. If during the show you want to send us your questions, your comments, or your bits of biblical brilliance, well, you can do so by going to stmarksferndale.com slash contact. That's S-T-M-A-R-K-S, ferndale.com slash contact. You can also leave us a review and hopefully a five-star rating of the show on the podcast platform that you like to use to listen to Cross Defense. Thanks for all your help, guys. We truly appreciate it. All right, so today we have the pleasure, the enormous pleasure of being joined by the brilliant Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz, former professor at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, my seminary, where both of us actually, we were classmates together, and we reunited a little bit when I was recruiting out there, and he was teaching. He was a professor at the same time that I was in the... uh, and the admissions counselor side of things. So it was great to visit with him and, and to touch base with him again. He is now the current pastor and evangelist at Trinity Lutheran Church in Denver, Colorado. He's with us today to teach us, uh, let's, let's call it a short class, a primer on apologetics for the nuns. And that would be your friends and family members, your coworkers and classmates, the growing number of neighbors all around us, who are not affiliated with any church or religion. It's not to be confused with those ladies who walk around in habits doing, uh, well, not the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, not those kind of nuns. Don't be confused with that at all. Uh, But the more Roman Catholic type, um, yeah, you get it. It's N-O-N-E-S. Reverend Kuntz is also familiar to many of us in the Missouri Synod because of his various teaching engagements across the Synod This guy is quite the teacher, as well as for the popular podcast, A Brief History of Power, where he and Reverend Jonathan Fisk get into some very engaging conversations. If you like Cross Defense, my friend, if you like this show, you'll love BHOP, Brief History of Power. I think that's what you say, right? BHOP, it's like IHOP, but with a B, and it sounds a little cooler. So um, yeah, if you like Cross Defense, you're going to love BHOP. The good doctor will be at St. Mark Lutheran Church here in Ferndale as our keynote speaker for our first ever Freedom of Conscience and Religious Liberty Conference. It's in a little under two weeks already, October 28th. And if you're in the area, we'd love for you to join us. There'll be a lunch. There'll be a a 
a chance to tour the pro-life uh, mobile uh, van from the J. Rofe Medical Center. They'll have their van down here where they do ultrasounds for moms who are considering abortions, and they, they see their babies, and they, they often change their mind because they can see the wonderful creation of God within their womb. And uh, there'll be a, a first-ever award, actually, too, of, of someone in Humboldt County who has exercised their freedom of conscience, whether religious or not, doesn't matter. They've used their freedom of conscience in a noteworthy way in the last you know calendar year. So the first time we will award this will be this year. The old cotton bale. It makes sense because this is the first conference, right? Yeah, of course. All right, well, enough of me. Grab your Bibles, my friends. It's time to sit at the feet of Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz. Reverend Kuntz, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. We are excited to learn how to defend the faith, how to fight the good fight of faith with that nebulous category of people known as nuns. So yeah. we're sitting at your feet, brother. Would you please teach all of us here at Cross Defense about apologetics for the nuns? Yeah, the nuns, N-O-N-E, <laughs> Uh, do not have special religious garb and uh, and are not Roman Catholic. <laughs> By definition, they're is that a big confusion who, for a lot of people? Uh, it's, it's it's a confusion for some. Yeah, yeah. it's phonetically it's the same thing, right? Yeah, phonetically it's the same, and it's a, it's a religious category that a lot of people don't think about, which is why I wanted to talk about it. Perfect. Um, they they don't think about it not because it's uncommon. By most measures, it's the fastest growing demographic. If you want to measure groups of people by their religion or lack thereof, not only in the United States, but in basically every developed country in the world, is that the group growing faster than any other, whether you know Muslim, Mormon, some kind of Christian, whatever, are people who have no religious affiliation. That doesn't mean that they have no religious practice. It just means that they so, have no affiliation. In the world, not just in the United States. Um, in the developed world. Okay. So you're talking, you're talking Europe, Japan, you know, Australia. Um, because in the, in the third world, generally religious affiliation is going to be high. That's a different question from practice. But, right. you know, most people in Saudi Arabia are going to say that they're Muslim. Most people in Nigeria are going to say they're Muslim or Christian, or, you know. But in Just the like developed here world, in America, we get a lot of people will say, yeah, I'm Christian. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and I think that's really what's changing mm -hmm. is that, yes, in previous generations, there was more religious instruction. People were probably likelier to have been raised in something. Right. But the group of people who had no affiliation, that's what's changing is that if we're saying that in previous generations, sure, there were always people who never went to church or never believed anything or whatever. We're saying that that group is just growing in its public acknowledgement of its own existence because where you live or where I live, and certainly um, the country is becoming more like California or Colorado than it is becoming like, say, Mississippi, <laughs> which is the place of greatest religious affiliation, right? Yeah. Um, Mississippi is becoming more like California than California is becoming like Mississippi is that what you're really dealing with is people seeing really no benefit to saying, Oh, I'm Christian. Like what's, what's the benefit to that? <laughs> you know, yeah, like, right. yeah. What's that going to do for you? So that's probably part of the growth. It's also why we want to distinguish, and this is important for what we're going to talk about biblically and tactically today between affiliation and, you know, a, com a combination of belief and practice. The person says he's not Christian. Okay, fine. That doesn't mean that he's not religious or doesn't have thoughts that religion doesn't address. I think a lot of Christians think to begin with that they really have nothing to say to their grandkid who doesn't go to church anymore or to their neighbor who's never been to a church. And biblically, that's just not true. Um, the apostles have a message and we're going to look specifically at the New Testament um, mostly today. The apostles have a message for the whole world, whether those people are practicing some kind of religion when they encounter the apostles, when they encounter that first preaching of the gospel or not. Um, the gospel still addresses them, even if they're not aware uh, of their need for it. 
Perfect. Okay. So we're going to see yeah. these people in our, in our friend circles. We're going to see these people in our families, coworkers, yeah. classmates, yeah. things like this. Right. What do we do? How do we do? How do we go about it? Yeah, I think the first place to start is just with a story. I, I generally find that when you're trying to learn something from the Bible, if you can attach a story to it, it's a little easier to hold on to it. So the story here would be in Acts 17 when the Apostle Paul encounters the Athenians. So that's probably a city that people know. Um, and it's a city that is very important kind of in terms of head knowledge, intellect, the study of philosophy in the ancient world. So you're dealing with some of your smartest people. And it's good to pick that one because I think one thing people worry about when they worry about evangelism and apologetics generally is that they don't know enough. So they, they don't know what to say because they don't know enough. Always. Well, yeah, right. And, and when Paul goes to Athens, guess what? Paul doesn't know. He hasn't read all of Plato. He hasn't read all of Aristotle. Um, you don't, you don't need to know everything in order to share the faith with somebody. He does know something, and this is our first tactic. We want to kind of combine the text with the tactic is that he knows that nature exists. And by nature, he means something implanted in mankind in every nation that makes them is given by God and makes them have some kind of contact with his with his existence and with their accountability to him in some form. It's why the Athenians, when Paul encounters them, are sacrificing already to a wide variety of pagan gods. And because they have some sense that there's something above them that is more powerful than they are. That vague sense is implanted by, by what we would call in terms of and here's our second scripture passage, Romans 1, that's implanted by the existence of nature. So if we say that something is natural or that it seems like second nature to him or something, we're appealing to that same idea that in everybody you meet, there is there are things that are given by God, set up by God in him that are going to be there whether he acknowledges it or not, and certainly whether he acknowledges the creator or not. They're there. Now that's going to get perverted in the term in the Athenians into worship of false gods. It gets perverted in relationships into um, all kinds of violations of the sixth commandment in Romans chapter one. But the reason that you're, you're doing something that is even wrong, but that somehow regards the gods is because it's in your nature to want to worship the things that are greater than you that you cannot control. And that is something that's going to get discussed in all kinds of ways by people today, but it's there, right? Why do they want a sense of significance or what do they, what do they do with that? Why do they want a sense that their life is worth something and what do they do with that? So when Paul rolls into Athens, he knows that he doesn't know everything that the Athenians know, and he doesn't need to. What he's going to begin after telling them about nature with is simply to say, you know, you guys know some of this stuff. You've figured some of it out yourself. So when you're talking about nature, you're also not talking. It's not like you're like going up to somebody who has never wanted super sharp kitchen knives and you're trying to sell them, you know, special kitchen knives. That's, you don't have to do that. That you don't, it's, it's not that hard. You're talking in terms of nature about things they've already thought about. So he says, I know you guys have thought about the fact that it's not really true that you come into contact with divine things through all these temples that you guys built here. And I know that you know that. So he quotes two kind of, you might say like mid-level, the way that I often explain this is like when you go into an airport bookstore and you pick up like a pop psychology book or you pick up you know books about emotional intelligence or something, kind of mid-level ideas. These are not highfalutin things. This is not Plato. This is not Aristotle. Paul's not educated in those things. He's not pretending to be somebody he's not. But he's got kind of pop ideas about what nature is and the fact that somehow we're accountable because of it. Because if something is built into me, like it's built into me that I should worship something, or it's built into me that 
uh, you shall not commit adultery somehow involves people are male and female and they're supposed to be together for a long time, maybe their whole lives. And so that means that I'm supposed to live a certain way, whether I do or not. That if something's built in and human beings are supposed to be one way, but then we realize in our heart of hearts that we're not. Now, I also have that goes along with the concept of nature. I have this idea of being accountable. And how do I know that I'm accountable? So this is where when you're looking at Acts 17, you want to notice and you want to expect in your own life that when you try to explain nature or something, you're going to run into not just resistance, but mockery. You're, you're going to encounter mockery. They're going to mock you because these are not people who are sitting there with their Bibles open saying, please explain the Bible to me better. I want to understand the Bible better. <laughs> Right? They already, they kind of run through those people as soon as they get anywhere. You know, Paul goes to a synagogue. He's looking for people who are reading the Bible. And to those people, he'll say, hey, Jesus, he's the Christ. He's the, you've been waiting for a Messiah? Got him. Let me show you, right? right? And in a way, that's a really easy task. And I think sometimes Lutherans actually get stuck on that task. We're trying to explain the Bible better to other Christians. And that's good. It's good to understand the Bible better. The difficulty is most people are not turning into non-Lutheran Christians who need to have the Bible explained better to them. What they're being raised as or what they're turning into when they leave church, probably sometime during their teen years, is a nun, N-O-N-E. Yeah. And therefore, that person is way out of contact with biblical context, with wanting to know the Bible better. They're not sitting around thinking to themselves, boy, I, I wish I, I wish I understood Christ's purposes for my life better. Right. <laughs> they, right. Like their, yeah. their love has been pulled away from Christ and towards the things of this world. So what the talking about nature does is it says, okay, you're living in the world. You're thinking about the things of this world. You've been thinking about money for a long time. You've been thinking about lust for a long time. You've been trying, you've been involved in whatever it is that you thought mattered more or you've never even heard about Christ or God or anything, right? Okay, fine. What about this thing inside of you? And so this is where, when you're looking at the different reactions to Paul in Acts 17, or you're looking at the process Paul describes in Romans 1, you'll notice some people do listen to him. Well, what is that in the person where when you talk about nature or you talk about being accountable for your actions, either today generally or when you think back on it in a couple of years, or maybe at the end of your life, being accountable, what is it that actually works in the person to make your words get some kind of traction? And that's what Paul's going to talk about in Romans 1, and that you see demonstrated in the people who do listen to the message in Acts 17 as conscience. And so that's not a concept that has been completely banished from everybody's life. Sometimes it gets turned into various psychological talking points. It's something that maybe their therapist has told them they shouldn't worry so much about. Lots of ways that this gets dealt with. The way that the Bible deals with the fact that when you do things that you know are unnatural, that are destructive, that maybe if you had the word you would even call sinful, the reason that hurts or you're harmed by it or you're haunted by it is because of conscience. Well, let's take a break right there for a moment just to uh, go and see what else is going on here at KFUO Radio. We'll be right back for more from Reverend Dr. Adam Koontz on apologetics for the nuns. Don't go away. Welcome back to Cross Defense. We're in the middle of our conversation with Reverend Dr. Adam Koontz the pastor and evangelist from Trinity Lutheran Church in Denver, Colorado, who's teaching us about apologetics for the nuns. Let's get into it like, right now. When you speak of nature, yeah. just to be clear yeah. for the audience, yeah, we might we might want to jump to the conclusion that you're, th you're talking about pointing people to look at the trees and, the, and things outside, but what yeah. you're bringing it to the conscience, the nature inside of us, that God yeah. created the cosmos and the conscience. And so we're, right. we're, we're drawing people to look at that commonality between the Christian and the nun and say, 
I know how my conscience is stricken when I do something wrong or when I sin. They don't have that language, that, that ability to articulate that, but they still have that feeling. They, they have that, that uh, pricking of the conscience. Yeah. And that's the nature you're referring to that we're, we're going to use our tactics well with is, is appealing to the conscience. Yeah, because, okay. and, and, and when we talk about Psalm 104, we'll talk about what that commonality is between, well, if God made the cosmos, then he also made me. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Right. Okay. Good. But, good. But yeah, I don't, primarily, know if, I don't know if too many Christians are really thinking about, we, no. we always, when we talk about nature and general revelation of God, all these kind of things, we're always thinking outside of ourselves, right. but we too are a part of creation, a part of nature. And the way our heart works, the way our, our conscience works. I mean, that's all designed by Nate. That's part of the natural revelation of God, right? That's, that's the natural uh, created order that we're talking about that we do have in common with every other human being. And this is brilliant, Adam. I know, right. I know you throw this out there just simply, but for the listener of cross defense, this is, this is the kind of stuff that makes you go, Oh yeah. I mean, I, we don't have to try to, to, to resonate with like a, like an answers in Genesis type of thing where we're looking at dinosaurs or like, we're not just talking about nature that way. We're also talking about nature of within me, within the person. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. Because that is the ground that Paul's going to use to start talking. Right. Yeah. Is that, is that I, I might sound weird to you. Um, some people are going to, are going to misunderstand the words that he's using. So they think that Jesus and the resurrection, two different phrases that he uses mm -hmm. in that speech are two different gods, gods. there in Acts 17. So they're very confused, some of them, by the words that he's saying. So that's going to happen too. But the traction that he gets with them and, and the ground that he's then going to use to stand on to proclaim the resurrection is going to be the fact that God, the God whom he proclaims, the God whom we believe in, is not far off from the nun. He's not far off from the Athenian pagan. He's not far off from the Californian or the Coloradan pagan. He is, in fact, very near to each of us. And we are accountable to him. And the way that we know that is that we all have a conscience that in some, some way is being harmed, but is also operating every time we do something for which we actually know we're accountable. Like the reason you didn't feel that good about telling your dad off because of the politics that he holds that you think are reprehensible. And you, the reason you don't enjoy it more, even though you feel that you're right, is because your conscience is telling you that yelling in your dad's face and telling him he's an idiot or ghosting him is wrong. You don't maybe know why, you don't maybe know how, but the reason that that's happening is because you have a nature that is designed to honor your father and you're not. Right. Okay. So, so the tactic, yeah. do, let's do a review here. We have yes, sir. from act 17, the tactic that we're tying together with that is, is the appeal to nature. Okay. And then from Romans one, we see from Romans one, we see that you need to assert that they are accountable, which you also okay. see in act 17. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. You need, they, you need to assert that they're accountable because the, the issue here is that both in Acts 17 and in Romans 1, you are making sure that they acknowledge the existence of conscience. If they don't acknowledge the existence of conscience, biblically speaking, they're saying they're not really human, which of course isn't true. Is this like sociopath type stuff? What are we dealing with? Yeah, this is, like yeah, what, what we, right, what we, what we usually describe, I was going to say in psychology, but what we're really talking about is true crime podcasts, right? And Netflix series. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. about serial killers is that when we say a sociopath, we're saying somebody who seems not to have a conscience. Right. Even in such a person, however, the reason that that person has to pretend to be empathetic or has to pretend to be brilliant in describing himself or whatever is because he at least perceives, even if he does not feel that other people see what he's doing as at least questionable, if not horrendous, right? So the existence of conscience is acknowledged even when the person has what the Bible would call a seared conscience, meaning it's been burned over so many times by doing something that it's possible to make your conscience dull. Where it used to be responsive, it's now become dull, like sort of dead skin, 
doesn't feel harm the same way that you know fully live skin does when it's when it's hurt or when it's used the word pricked earlier so even where somebody seems not to have a conscience the reason he has to behave the way he does with other people especially in explaining his own actions is because he's actually acknowledging human nature he's acknowledging the existence of conscience yeah yeah Yeah, that's helpful yeah so um let's kind of roll it into something that you mentioned earlier and something that you know living in colorado very beautiful place living in the part of california you do i'm sure you feel the same way yeah people are going to be out here pretty soon you're going to see and maybe we can yeah that's right (laughs) (laughs) is is the connection between creation or nature the way we usually use those words yeah and creation and nature the way that they're used in Acts 17 and romans 1 and the place to kind of roll those together is uh psalm 104 which is which is one of the when sometimes when people want to they want to group the different psalms together one way to do that is to say oh what are the ones that have common topics and so psalm 104 is going to come together with a few others under the creation psalms because it's a it's a it's a portrayal of creation it's not a portrayal of creation you mentioned answers in genesis earlier in terms of discussion of how old the earth is or or what kinds of creatures were upon it at which times it's a portrayal of creation in terms of if i observe creation what is it that i should do and this is helpful apologetically uh, for kind of two different kinds of people so in a in a really simple way if you have somebody who loves the outdoors one thing that you want to begin to ask him and one thing that it's easy for paul to appeal to when he talks to ancient people because ancient people i mean one way to think about the ancient world is everybody's always on the equivalent for us of a camping trip right the sky is totally dark at night <laughs> yeah. right like yeah. you can you can see all the stars yeah. and that makes yeah. you no that makes you open. No, yeah. right yeah and so you're you're not dulled to the reality of the awesomeness in both senses of that word, huge and wonderful of God's creation, right? Because of that, if you have somebody like that in your own life and you you open up Psalm 104, either with them or before you're gonna talk to them or whatever, one thing that you can see is that there should be a, a direct connection between observing how amazing this all is and how large it is and how little control, really no control we have over it. And the existence, therefore, of a maker of these things. Mm. Okay. Now, Paul says that in Romans 1, too. He says that even the person who is what we would call a nun, an O-N-E, even that person is able to look at nature, both inside of himself and outside of himself. And it's all, it's all the outside stuff in Psalm 104. He should be able to look at it and say, there is a God and he is mighty. Now, anything else about him, who knows, right? Anything else, who, who knows what he's going to do? Who knows if he's going to crush me? Like I found these animals that, you know, fell off a cliff uh, because they were frightened and they ran over a cliff. They didn't see what was coming. Um, who knows if it's going to be red in tooth and claw, but he does exist and he's mighty. So that's one thing, because one thing that you want to remember in any kind of apologetics with any kind of person you're talking to is that what you're doing is you're bringing home to people in a clear way things that otherwise they would maybe think about and then pass by. Okay, so I'm on the camping trip. I'm looking at the stars. And so if you're not dealing with somebody who loves the outdoors, this is also true with somebody who stays inside all the time. They have a nature inside of themselves. Where did they come from? How did they get here? Why do they have the impulses that they do? Why are they, why do they behave the way that they do? Why do they feel they should behave differently? Because with the big difference between nature out there and nature inside of a human being is that the nature inside of a human being is fundamentally in conflict. We are never who we want to be right? Yeah, we're never who we want to be. And so what I can always appeal to there, whether I'm just talking about what's inside of him, or I'm talking about what's outside of him, is that it came from somewhere else, it was made by some other agency, we didn't make ourselves. When that happens, now I'm engaging the conscience, now I'm engaging his sense of wonder, perhaps in talking about creation. 
But the other thing that I want to engage in talking about nature is that in Psalm 104, understanding that he made these things should be cause for praise. Okay, so this is this is one way to talk about accountability. There are lots of ways you could talk about depending on the people you're dealing with. But one way you can talk about it is you could say, if somebody made these things that are so amazing that people will fly all the way across the country to see the leaves in New England in, in the fall, then then what what is due to such an artist? I mean, what kind of praise is due to such an artist? People don't think about that because their conscience is dulled to such beauty. Okay. Now, oh, man, Paul that's, doesn't. That's yeah. that's amazing. Out here in the redwoods, we get you know people from Japan all over that yeah, Orient. They right. fly out here. They get all their pictures of tourism. You know, see these giant, wonderful, ancient trees. Yeah. And who, how many of them are stopping to think about that? that's so true? Wow. Yeah. Thank, th right. thank and, you, and, brother. Thank you. Uh, it's no worries. But I, I mean, I think I think what what Paul does that is that is amazing here in Acts seventeen is that he takes that sentiment. That, that is there, that is there in your Taurus from Japan, that is there in the Athenians who are always on a camping trip practically their whole lives long, in anybody who observes these things. And he says, guess what? Um, this is all under his power. And guess what else he has done? And whenever you're doing apologetics, you don't want to leave it just in terms of purely breaking down their thoughts and saying, gee, I guess I am awful or Wow, creation really <laughs> is big, right? He also is going to say thing to do to somebody, yeah, right. Is is he's going to say there is a resurrection and he has appointed a man. Now it's kind of, just kind of an interesting little thing that in in the speech that we get in Paul's words in Acts seventeen, he doesn't use the word Jesus, but we know from the reactions that people had that he did use that word. So we know that the speech is we're getting basically a summary of it. Because he says there is a man whom he has appointed. We know from their reaction that he named that man Jesus. Oh. So what's, hap what's happening, right, is that you want to give them a sense that there is hope for them and their conflicted nature. And there is hope for the whole creation, like Paul talks about in Romans 8, the creation waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, is that the hope that all of this has, the anchor that they can put their future on, is not the various things that are going to disappoint them, but the resurrected Christ. So what's happening, even with nuns, okay, people with no Bible information, people with no knowledge of Jesus of Nazareth before you show up, people simply with a knowledge of creation, is that Paul moves quickly from creation to accountability, to conscience, to judgment, to resurrection. And that, that that step moves you from, I have no idea what you're talking about to, okay, you're specifically talking about how I need to trust in Jesus of Nazareth, who is resurrected from the dead. Now, the reactions to that, I mean, some people make fun of him. They call him a babbler, meaning your words don't make any sense. Um, some people are just confused. They're like, how many gods are you talking about? But some people actually believe what he's saying. And... The power there, and I, and I would say not so much a tactic as an encouragement to your listeners, is if you just say it, okay, that is far more powerful than you thinking that you're going to come up with words that are going to prevent somebody from saying, what are you talking about? Or you're dumb, right? I mean, the Apostle Paul was called stupid. The Apostle Paul was misunderstood. Yeah. Do you think you're going to, I mean, I'm not going to do any better. Right. <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. right. That's, that's absolutely right. Because we either by the enemy's prompting or our own sinful Adam's uh, attacks within us or whatever it is, we are afraid to speak so often. All we're called to do is speak the truth, right? Just say right. the words, just speak it right. up and, and engage. You're not called to be brilliant. You're not called to, to be, like you said, to know Plato and Aristotle or to know, you know who Doja Cat is or I, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you're called just to engage them, right? I mean, so, so many people have now you lost me. Me a, Yeah, they've been asking me to do a reaction video to Doja Cat. I don't know who that is. Um, so, <laughs> but we are, but, but you're absolutely right. Just, you know, engage and speak and let, let the, uh, the burden be on the Holy Spirit to, to work with that and, and, 
put that on other people. Thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. I, have a, I have a follow-up question just in yes, a little bit off topic, but perhaps related in the sense of, as you're painting the picture of the, uh, the Athenians on their, their uh, Labor Day weekend camp out and how that helped them see the awe and wonder of God, sometimes you get people who you'll come across where in our modern day with all of our design, all of our our fancy you know, Tesla cars and all, all the different elaborate systems that we have, you'll get yeah. people who will say in the apologetics realm, like, so how do we, I mean, we see these robots, we see AI, we see all this intelligent design, and yet we're so dumb and hard hearted that we reject the design of a creator. Yeah. And as you were talking about seeing creation in nature, it sort of dawned on me that we're surrounded more by creation of man. And so there is the, the doling of the conscience that we're talking about and that, that failure to see God in yeah. our surroundings, it kind of makes a little bit of sense that we're seeing ourselves. And it actually, I can, I have a little more empathy for the person who doesn't see the creator because if he looks out around and all he sees is, you know, a concrete jungle and an artificial everything. Right. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's something that's just discussed in, in terms of biology as nature blindness, which, which afflicts basically anybody who lives in modern America. And if it doesn't, you are very ex exceptional. Meaning if they go to your area and I say, um, you know, this is, this is a really easy question, you know, tell me the difference between a redwood and a, and an oak, they can't do it. And the difficulty there is then, you know, multiplied it almost infinitely in terms of just the things that cross their mind, because something that's happening when you're proclaiming the gospel to somebody is that you're, what you're, what you're doing among other things is you're focusing his train of thought. You're taking things that yes, have traction in terms of talking about nature inside of him and outside of him. But you're but you're pushing those towards a certain conclusion in terms of accountability, in terms of conscience, in terms of judgment, toward focusing on Jesus Christ and what he did. You're you're focusing his thoughts. So we have two problems regarding technology. I don't think it's hopeless, but we have two problems. One is it further our our, our immersion in technology furthers our nature blindness outside of ourselves very obviously because we just have little to do with oaks or redwoods but also inside of us because number two it increases our amount of distraction and what what's happening when we're thinking about jesus christ about death about judgment about accountability about conscience is that our thoughts are being focused rather than distracted i mean that's one reason that we're we're quiet in church is yeah. so we can focus you know what i mean yeah. so when you're dealing with that it's not hopeless but it's probably a, a quicker route. And that's why I did acts and Romans before talking about Psalm 104, it's probably a quicker route to talk about his own life and his own conscience and his own actions before you talk about the redwoods or the oaks, Yeah, because it, he's still somewhat familiar and he's very familiar with this reality, which is uh, most of the time, his problems with technology are not due to the technology itself. It's due to him using User the technology. Error. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so there is a fault in our stars. I mean, human yeah. nature is still faulty. So he has familiarity with that, even if he can't tell you the difference between a redwood and an oak. That is brilliant. Reverend Dr. Adam Coons, thank you so much for this. Yeah. Can you wrap up pleasure. anything? Is there anything I didn't let you, let you have time to say? No, oh. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the redwoods with you soon. Wonderful. Yeah, we can't wait for you to be out here. I, I, I'm i looking forward to this episode coming out this week to be a little uh, teaser for at least yeah. the local audience, because I know they're very much anticipating a lot of a lot of the members here have already seen your videos. Uh, I've, I've you know, promoted you and your teaching here among us. So there, a lot of them are familiar with you, but some still are not. And and now I, I can't promise you a peaceful weekend, brother. Uh, we've got a lot of controversy coming up around this conference. It's the, our first uh, Freedom of Conscience and Religious Liberty Conference. You happen to be our keynote speaker, so you're being dragged into this. You made the newspaper this week, brother. You made the newspaper. Uh, <laughs> just by virtue of being our speaker, you're here. So uh, you're Outstanding. Uh, in the paper. So, um, yeah, it'll yeah. be fun. So we can't wait to have you out. Thanks for coming on. Um, Thank you. And Thanks for teaching everybody here at Cross Defense a little bit more about how we can be confident to engage 
you're equipping our mind and we're appreciative for that. And um, hopefully we can be a blessing to all those nuns out there. My pleasure. Thank you so much. We're going to take our second break. Thanks for listening to Cross Defense. We'll be right back in just a minute. Hey, do you read books? I read books. I think the people in the quiet corner of Connecticut read books. So if you're like any of us, before you order your next book from Amazon, consider supporting the Bramwell Family Bookstore right here in Ferndale, California. That's right. We have a bookstore. It's the number one boycotted bookstore in Humboldt County. None of the LGBTQ want to see us survive. And when you shop online at bookshop.org and you select Butterfat Books as the shop you want to support, we, since we're a member of the American Booksellers Association, it's just like you're shopping in our brick and mortar store. So go to bookshop.org, select Butterfat Books as the bookshop you want to support, and then, hey, order that book you were going to order from Amazon read it make sure you read it that's important you're listening to cross defense thanks for tuning in dear saints reverend Koontz is brilliant and i highly recommend you listen to anything and everything he has to say you can find recordings of some of his lectures and talks on youtube just search his name adam Koontz, reverend Koontz, dr Koontz. stuff is going to come up and you're going to be blessed by it there's also something else that you should know about Reverend Kuntz, and that is his five-volume Bible commentary that's set to come out this year. Well, at least volume one is set to release this December with a new volume every year until 2027. If you order now, you can get 25% off the whole set, and the link, as you know, is in the show notes below. All right, so Dale wrote in because he disagrees with my pastoral opinion about women reading the scripture lessons. And, and Sunday school and all these kind of things. And he said, I'm wondering, if you feel that this is so wrong, why do you not bring this to the attention of Senate President Matthew Harrison? And I think that if this is as unscriptural as you think, he says, it should be brought to his attention. I don't really expect you to respond to this, as you don't seem to be someone that takes criticism very well. Sincerely, Dale. Now, Dale couple of things to begin with, anyway. If you don't expect me to respond, why did you take the time to write in? Now, I try to get to as many listener responses as possible because I've said on the show before, if you take the time to write in, I want to take the time to address your comment. Plus, I'm the one every episode asking listeners to write in with their comments, their questions, and their bits of biblical brilliance because I want to share them. I want to respond to them. And we do quite regularly. So can I get to all of them? No, of course not. We get one hour a week and we do the best we can to get to as many as we can. And when we can't get to very many all for a while, we we throw in an episode like the last one you saw, the one you responded to, a from the inbox episode. So that's kind of peculiar, but, but you wrote in, so I am happy to supersede your expectations. But I want to ask you, why do you say I don't seem to be someone that takes criticism very well? Why would you say that? I mean, you wrote in regarding my opinion about female readers, which was the last episode wherein I addressed the criticism from not only one, but two people, from both an ELCA pastor and from a lay listener who criticized me. And how did I respond? I responded with scripture. I responded honestly, openly publicly, reasonably. So, so what would qualify as responding well if, if not these things? Would it have to be, does it have to be agreeing with the person offering the criticism? Do I have to agree with what is said about me, the, the, the critical thoughts said about me in order to be responding well to them? See, that's not the measure of a well-reasoned response to criticism, at least Not as I see it. Not at all. I think responding well to criticism is giving it consideration, which I did in spades with Mr. Besmer's criticism. I think you should be able to admit that, didn't I? And if I don't agree with the criticism after considering it, then articulating from Scripture why that critique falls short which is exactly what I've done with every bit of criticism that I've shared on this show. And I'm not shy about sharing criticism on this show because I think it helps the 
apologetic effort. It helps equip our minds. It helps see how we can respond. It helps see uh, the er erroneous ways we can respond. It helps see the positive ways we can respond. It gives our imagination something to be excited by, you know, in a very clinical way of saying that, not excited in like a, a, a popular way, but we can, our imaginations are peaked to where we can see ourselves, you listeners can see yourselves engaging in the same kind of situation or resonate with that same situation from your past experience. And so, yeah, I'm not shy at all about sharing criticism on this show. In fact, it helps the aim of this show tremendously. So thank you for writing in, just as I thanked uh, Mr. Besmer and I'm thankful for uh, Pastor Hubbard and all the other criticism that's come this way. Uh, over the course of the last year or so. So perhaps, I would also say, perhaps as the most criticized pastor in the LCMS, and I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it certainly feels like it from where I sit, certainly the most criticized pastor in Humboldt County across all the different denominational affiliations, as that guy, and and I'm, and I'm criticized publicly, I mean, I'm talking letters to the editor, articles, hit pieces, constantly all the different things social media everyone smears me all this stuff i think that it's fair to acknowledge that i've learned to respond to criticism quite well but again responding to it doesn't mean acquiescing to it it doesn't mean assenting to it or changing my my position because of it that's not what it means to respond well to criticism for instance let's Let's consider your charge against me that I don't respond well to criticism. You simply wrote in an assertion that I don't respond well to criticism, that I seem to be someone who doesn't respond well. What am I supposed to do with that other than answer it if I have time, which I'm doing right now, giving you the time of day that I think you deserve when you write in, treating you with respect and kindness and and giving you a little bit of this airtime in that regard. You, you didn't give me any rationale to actually work with that could move me from one course of action to another, which is what I do with my critics, isn't it? I take their words and then I address them, not personally, even though the, critic, the criticism that I get is usually personal attack in some way. It's not really a logical argument. It's more of a, a backhanded uh, insult or or something along those lines so i don't respond personally even though that's the form of criticism i get but i i respond biblically that is i i respond according to to the norming standard of our lives scripture right now you're wondering as you said why i don't address president harrison regarding women lay readers if i feel so strongly about it but how do you know, though, Mr. Dale? How do you know I haven't? You're making an assumption. You heard my answer to a listener who asked for my pastoral position on the topic. And I made abundantly clear that it was simply my own personal pastoral opinion. I didn't claim to be speaking for the Missouri Synod. I didn't claim to be speaking for the California, Nevada, Hawaii district of the Synod. I didn't claim to be speaking for my own circuit. I claim to be speaking, not even for St. Mark's. I claim to be speaking for Pastor Bramwell because that's who was asked to give an opinion, to give a position. I didn't say anything about the inner workings of the Synod that would have been inappropriate. I didn't say anything about what could be done to change things and why they should be done or shouldn't be done. I didn't say any of that kind of stuff because that wasn't the topic of Mrs. Ford's question. There are indeed proper methods and avenues to work on addressing the Synod's position and, and whether our, our doctrine and practice align. And there's proper protocols and, and we've established our own constitution and bylaws and we have all the handbook. We have all these kind of methods and we have a fraternal uh, friendship and, and collegial behaviors that we all interact with as pastors. And guess what? You have no way of knowing how I do those things, how I'm engaged in those things how involved in them I am from what I say here on cross defense. You have nothing. You're in the dark. 
because I don't share those things on cross defense because again, that would not be appropriate. And because you know, you know that you don't know and will never know what I'm doing off air in relation to doctrinal fidelity in the LCMS. Because of that, I can only take your email as a frustrated message sent because, as you said in the beginning, you disagree with me. And as you made clear in your tone at the end, that's how I should read your words. But, but Dale, my friend, I don't know you, but in the general term, friend, we're allowed we're allowed to have different opinions. You you know you're allowed to have your own opinion, right? For instance, proof in point. Another listener, Carl Cecil 79 said, "My pastor agreed with your position on no female readers of the word. Keep up the good work. God bless you." From the quiet corner of Connecticut. See, we're allowed to have different opinions. And, and when asked what they are, we're allowed to voice them. We're even allowed to accept a pastor's invitation to share those opinions with him via email and sign off with words of contempt. And we're even allowed to do that knowing that this said pastor is the host of a radio show who will respond on air because that's why he's asking for comments so he can make the listeners a part of the program, which is good radio. The thing we need to remember, Dale, is that opinions, whether supporting us or disagreeing with us, these opinions are not how we make decisions about the views we hold. What, what is the thing that shapes our views? What does form our opinions on things? Scripture, as you know, I hope you know. I assume you know. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 4 says this. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. It is the Lord. He judges us, Dale. I don't concern myself too much with your judgment about me. Just as I don't concern myself too much with Carl Cecil 79's pastor's judgment of me. Although I appreciate the comments, the questions, and the bits of biblical brilliance. And I do appreciate uh, as we all do, as humans do, when others agree with us, it does make us feel good to know that we're not alone. It does reinforce truth when it happens. We, we do build each other up this way. We do stir one another up to good works. We do sharpen iron with iron, all that kind of thing. So there is a value in that positive reinforcement, but scripture is the thing that shapes why I hold the views I, I hold, not you or anyone else. And with that, my friends, well, we're out of time. <laughs> so I want to I want to say thank you for all who are listening. Thank you for sending in your comments, your questions, and your bits of biblical brilliance. And thank you, Dale, very much for your comment. And I do hope you see that I do respond. And I respond well. And I respond thoughtfully. And I hope and pray that you will hear that. And that you will know you are loved by God. And you are given the time of day by faithful pastors who would like for nothing else than for you to see the truth of Scripture, not knowing anything about you, not knowing any of your, your uh, positions on anything other than what you've said. I pray, my friend, that you will know all the faithful pastors out there in the Missouri Synod are doing things to make our practice align with our doctrine when we discover that they're out of whack or out of sync we do take steps that you'll never know about, perhaps unless your pastor, wherever you are, tells you he's done it, um, to, to right the wrongs that we see, and that we all are also working as a synod. We're walking together, and we all have our various vocations. Pastor Harrison is doing the work that the president of the synod is given to do. 
I here as pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church and doing the work I'm given to do, and certainly I am concerned more about what's going on with this flock than I am with any of the other flocks. Although I do hope and I do work to serve in a way where I can be a, an influence, not only through those collegial channels that we've established in our synod, but also through my own witness, whether it's here on the air or on uh, my YouTube channel or in person or whatever, where I could be uh, of service to my brother pastors, to strengthen them, if that be the Lord's will, as they strengthen me. It's hearing about the uh, pastor in Connecticut. He strengthens me to know that someone on the complete other side of the continent is doing the same thing I'm doing because we are truly walking together. Okay, well, I said we're out of time and I started to run on a little longer. So bless you. Praise be to God for all of you. Thank you for listening. Christ be with you all, especially with you, Dale. And for all of you Christians who are out there in that quiet part of Connecticut, know this, I'm giving thanks to God for your faithful pastor. Amen. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at kfuo.org.